about how prepared my heart is to the people around me. If I am a serving of the Lord's love and goodness, goodness around me, then you'll get to people. You'll be able to release that everywhere you go. So, Lord, we just thank you for everything you're going to do. I ask, Father, that you would just release the words, Lord, that are going to speak to each person's life. I ask, Lord, that you would just minister grace to every hearer. I pray, Lord, that they wouldn't just hear, but they would heed every word that's spoken from the word of God. I pray, Lord, that the word of God would be esteemed highly in the earth again and in your people. I pray, Lord, that you would, by your spirit, Reveal truth, even deeper revelation, Lord. The things that you have in mind for this season and this place, Lord. The region is ripe unto harvest, Lord. And we want to be a people that will release your goodness, that will release your loving kindness, that will release your mind, and that will show forth the goodness of who you are. And so we just give you thanks for being in that privileged place as sons and daughters. And I thank you, Lord, for every person in here. Let their ears be blessed and their heart and mind be blessed. And we just thank you for the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who takes away the sins of the world. And we thank you, Lord, for nothing, no hindrance in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So those are important things as, we, as we're praying. We want to make sure that you're ready to hear. We want to make sure that you're excited on what the Lord's going to speak about. Uh, at first, I, I first wanted to title this message last week when I talked about it in the afternoon. I talked about this, this frustrating grace. But I was like, man, grace is so awesome. You couldn't really frustrate it too easily. Even though there's a scripture on frustrating grace, the scripture's actually talking about our uh, not going along with the thing that's trying to take us along. Now, can you imagine being strapped to a rocket and kind of holding on real tight, kind of, you know, put your, put your hips into it. You're the ground, you're, you know, you're holding on, and the rocket gets ready to launch. But you're like grounded, man. You're steadfast, unmovable, doing your own thing. T tell you a secret. When the rocket gets going, it won't matter what you are. You will be going. So it's kind of like that with grace. It's like we don't want to like go against what we could be having in our life. In other words, all these things are available to us in God. We don't want to be like even diverting a little bit because it can be so much more amazing as we yield to, to the plans and purposes of God. So go ahead and put that first slide up. We're talking about empowering grace and uh as we talk about empowering grace, the plans of God that God has for you that are available to you are going to be hopefully opened up to your understanding. So let's go ahead and get go, go ahead and in, into the first slide, please. All right. Well, y'all are going to make this fun, huh? There we go. All right. Thank you. So allowing God's plan to prosper you. Now, prosperity is actually not a word that means having more money. Prosperity is kind of like the word salvation. It's supposed to be an all-included, all-encompassing me looking much more like Papa God. I look like my dad. When people see you, they should, be, they should start saying things like, you remind me so much of Jesus. That would be a great compliment. That's what, that's what my, my spouse that's what Tracy needs to say more often, Lord, in Jesus' name right now. Just receive that. You look so much like Jesus. Go ahead. Just practice that. You look to your neighbor. Look to the person next to you and say, you look so much like Jesus. You look so much like Jesus. You look like your dad. <laughs> Come on. You need to practice. I'm telling you, this is really important. You look so much like your dad. You look like your daddy. You have to practice these things. If you don't practice, it's going to be really hard in the world when things are trying to come against you and frustrate you. You practice these things in the house of God, and it becomes that much easier to just manifest them right here together. So it's really exciting. All right. So the next slide here is uh, it's really where we start getting into it. So here's where uh, truth is kind of 
so inclusive, right? We, we have so many truths out there, and this is why people get so hung up on things, right? If you imagine all these different things going on, and you have these spheres that are all different kinds of truth, and uh, I have judgment and mercy and faith and grace encompassing almost all of those things. Some of them kind of like half in and half out. Most of them are in, and then you got some things that are outside because the reality is grace encompasses most things. And then uh, as you think about grace and mercy and judgment and faith, see, faith is by grace. Everybody in here that has problems of faith, just realize this. Faith was never the problem. Every man was given a measure of faith. Guess what? The problem isn't having faith or not having faith. The problem is using faith. Faith isn't the problem. Like, I feel like I need more faith. People say that to me all the time. Actually, you should never say that again. You don't need more faith. The faith you're given is good enough. You are given the faith you need. And once you start discovering the faith you have and discovering the faith that's in you, that God gave you, every man, say it again, was given a measure of faith. That measure is meant to be used. And when we don't use our faith, we end up in places that make us say things like, I need more faith. Because what we need is more obedience to the faith we have. In fact, God said the only faith you need is to know God can do it. I think most of us are there, right? Most of us in this place would say God can do it. If we get a hold of God can do it, God is able, then the rest of it's easy for God. So our faith just needs to be activated and say, God, you can do this. I thank you, Lord. You care about me. So grace wraps that up. Amen? All right. So maybe this is why I don't use PowerPoints too often. So love is the ultimate truth. Love is actually a person. His name is God. God is love. And love is encompassing all in all. There's not a place that love doesn't encompass. In fact, love and truth are hand in hand. Truth is in Christ. Christ is truth. He's the way, the truth, and ultimately he's the life. Life. The word life is actually who Jesus is. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And so in this truth or this, the love of God, we enc he encompasses all in all. So in, you could hopefully see how all these different truths we get talking about. In fact, the Lucas was asking me yesterday, how do you like deal with all these different things in the Bible? Like, how do you know which one to focus on and which one's for you and which one you're called to? I was like, well, first of all, don't take a new truth and go running with it. Take a new truth and add it to everything you have. You don't take a new thing and sell everything you have to get the new thing. You only take one thing to sell everything you have, and that's the pearl of great price. You find Jesus, and you sell everything you have to have him. Once you have Jesus, everything else is kind of like, if you had a Charlie Brown Christmas tree this Christmas, ours is fake, which is probably worse, but, but you, you, you start with the tree, but then you start hanging the ornaments on it. It's the beauty of the ornaments that makes the tree amazing. It's the beauty of the lights. It's the garland. It's all the, it's all the extras that make it really beautiful, right? All that beauty is meant to be a illumination to the world. It's meant to draw the world in. Look at what God has done. And so when, when you see what God has done, it's he's hung all these truths on who you are. Because you first said, Jesus is Lord. And he, he said, I'm going to make you a tree of righteousness. And so I'm a tree of right standing automatically. Really important. I'm going to say that again. I am a tree of righteousness automatically because I received Jesus. Now once the blood's applied, now my heart needs to yield and be obedient so I can walk in holiness. Because holiness, without holiness, no one can see God. What, what does that mean, guys? Does that mean one day or does it mean every day? It means every day, and that's a big difference. Doesn't mean I'll have condemnation when I get to heaven, but maybe it does. But what if worse every day is gloomed over because I haven't yielded to God's plan for my life? 
Every day is gloomier than the day before instead of more beautiful as God's exposing his plan for my life, exposing his plan for my marriage, exposing his plan for my children, exposing his plan for why I'm at the workplace I'm at besides just being a person making a dollar. All these things, God starts to blossom this plan because I start to yield to who he says I am. And when I yield to holiness, I get to see him. I get to see God. So that's a really big deal. It's a huge, uh, amazing opportunity for all of us to step into the plan of God. So now that we see that, we can begin to step into the real core of the lesson. We're going to start with the two bottom things, which I believe are really uh, heavyweight issues in the church, right? There are the two different schools of thought. There we go. Heavyweight contenders right here. Mercy and judgment. Heavyweight contenders. We have a, a score of our take, ladies and gentlemen. One is defined, mercy is defined by not getting what we deserve, while judgment's defined as getting what we deserve. Re the reciprocity of mercy is that if we are merciful, we'll reap mercy, while it returns with the measure that's used. And in like manner, judgment is defined as getting what we deserve. It also is re re has the... Uh, reciprocity that if we judge then we will be judged the same thing applies with the measure that I use the measuring cup scoop a big uh, a big scoop of judgment then that measure will be scooped back to me really important uh, concept here as you start to think about these two truths everybody say the word truths you know Pilate Pilate when Jesus was in front of Pilate he said, what is truth? Because Jesus comes at him with this truth like, you couldn't do anything to me unless my Father in heaven gave you authority to do it. And he says, what is truth? Like, what are you talking about? Like, to me, everything's whatever I feel like is true. Let me give everybody a, a hint. Because this was the eye-shattering awakening that really plagued me for many years is that I wasn't God. He has a truth, and that's the truth no matter how I feel about it. No matter how I think it should be. No matter how I think this church should be. No matter how I think my home should be. No matter how I think my job should be. God's truth is the only truth that matters. And that's really important. Everybody says amen there. But why is your truth always conflicting with his truth? It's really important to figure that out because... What happens here, right, in this, in this law of reciprocity, that means reciprocation. Like, it's like a boomerang effect, right? If I'm going to chuck it out there, just be ready, it's coming back. Just be ready, it's coming back. Now, real quick, when we talk about mercy and judgment, out of the book of James, there's amazing scripture. It says, James, this is chapter 2. Verse 8, now, mercy, I want you guys to be able to get this in your head because I'm doing a visual learning because I want you so desperately to get this. It took me like way longer than I wanted to to do the stuff that's easy for me to do, but I'm like, wow, this stuff is time consuming. I did this visual learning because I want you to get this. Mercy means? All right, so like, about 5% of the room learned so far. That's great. Okay, mercy means not getting what you deserve. Not getting what you deserve. Why am I taking so much time for this? Because God's mercy is important, but if you don't have any, you will be subject to the other law, which is judgment. Getting what you deserve. If you want to get what you deserve then you don't sow mercy and you sow judgment. Not that judgment's bad. It's very amazing. It's very good. It's how you judge. You need to be ready for your judgment to come back to you. 
in righteous judgment, we're all supposed to judge. And Jesus even said, don't you know you're going to judge even angels? There's a lot of, th there's a lot of importance to this. It doesn't mean one's inferior. They're both alive and they're both kind of, they're both true and they're not, one's not going to make the other one null and void. And in James chapter 2, I gave you extra time for your Bible, verse 8, it says, If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, that means loving certain people that can do you better, you are committing sin and you and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. For whosoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one area, he has become guilty of all. And he, for he said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now if, you, now if you do not commit adultery, but you commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is huge, guys. I, I could probably spend three hours on this one scripture here. Mercy and judgment both are going to be true. Both are going to be the law. Like gravity, whatever goes up must come down. It's going to happen. So the question is, and, and let me just get a little clearer on this judgment issue, because the reality is here, it's talking about adultery, and it's talking about, um, it's talking about murder. Two of the things which Jesus talked about, he says, you say that you don't commit murder, but anytime you have a thought that's evil towards your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. Anytime you're unforgiving to someone, you're committing murder in your heart. Anytime you don't forgive someone, you're committing murder in your heart. Do you want to be a murderer? See, we have to deal with this stuff because people are constantly making it okay to be where they're at. And it's completely doesn't make it okay by God. We can't justify because one day we're going to stand before the judge. And the judge isn't going to say it's okay. He's going to say, remember when you were in Redemption House and that guy said, if you don't forgive, it will not be forgiven to you. There's a great story in the Bible about a man. I'll, I'll say the other one, too. He says, uh, anyone that looks at a woman, let's say a man, too, because I'm going to leave the, because you guys, all the women want equal rights here. So if a woman looks at a man in lust over his big guns or whatever y'all lust over, I don't know what y'all lust over. Whatever it is, you could be lusting after his bank account. You could be lusting after all kinds of stuff. But when you lust, there must be a lot of lusters here, all that. A lot of conviction going on right now. Lord, just deliver us in Jesus' name. We plead the blood right now. Loose it. Let it go. Mercy, Lord. <coughs> so, so it's an amazing story. This, this king has the man come before him. And that, when the man comes before him, he says, You've taken millions of dollars from me, and you're guilty. And the man said, please have mercy on me. And he says, I'll have mercy on you because I am a merciful king. And the king lets him go. And he gets out on the streets. He starts his hustle on again. And he finds a man. He says, dude, you owe me 100 bucks. Where's my 100 bucks? And he's like, what do you mean you don't have it? You better have my money. He said, like, he takes him to jail for his hundred bucks. He, 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 he uh, takes his family into captivity as slaves so they could start working off his hundred bucks. And the merciful king finds out about this guy who he'd forgiven for millions. 
to, that he goes and tries to capture somebody else for his hundred. This is what we do when we're unforgiving. We become the, un, we become the unmerciful person who forgot about how we've been forgiven and won't even forgive somebody. And you say, no, he, no, 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 you don't understand, pastor. They, they, did, they, had, they had taken tens of thousands of dollars. No matter what you could put on the scale, God's forgiven you of more. No matter what you've, no matter what someone's done to you, God forgave you of more that you've done. And so that's the moral story here. And the reason why it's so important is because we live in a world where everything's becoming blurred. And the goal of the blur is that we would just live loose lives. That we wouldn't walk circumspectly. That we would really, the goal of it is to make no difference. To become completely impotent in our pursuit and our walk with God. That our walk doesn't mean anything because our walk is constantly discredited because of, of the places where we're making, uh, making immoral decisions so that the people that hear us can't think because we're contradicting ourselves. Like, this, do what I say, not really what I do, you know. Uh, I remember my wife had this horrible time when I was, like, correcting the kids for stuff, and she's like, honey, you got to stop. you got to stop. She's saying, mercy, honey, just have mercy on the kids. I can't do what you're doing because... If you're telling them not to and I'm doing it, it's not okay. She says, they're seeing me do it and you're telling them it's not okay. And so she's caught with this big mom's heart. Like, they see this in me. She could have said they see it in you. But she was too sweet for that. That's a real lover right there. And really, that's the heart of the Father. That's the heart of Jesus, right? Jesus took our place and said, I'll take the judgment. I'm one of them. See how he did it? He stepped in my place and took my sin upon himself and said, I'm one of them. I deserve it. I'm going to take it. That's the power of the love of God right there. And so it says that this last two verses, it says, so speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, which is a law that Jesus brought into the earth, right? He showed us instead of the law of, uh, instead of the original law, he showed us the, this law of liberty. And when we look into the perfect law of liberty, we become free from the law of sin and death. Two laws at work here. The law of sin and death and the law of grace. And so Jesus came to give us this law of liberty and he says, we're going to be judged liberally. And it says, because if you want to be judged by the law of sin and death, judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy because mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's go ahead and put that slide back up. And I want you to see this um, the, in the slide there, the law of sowing and reaping is going on here with this reciprocity. But here's the amazing thing. In our lives, these two bank accounts are constantly in flux. And usually what we're doing is taking money out of one account and we're putting it into the money in the other account. We have like some people like their, their mercy account actually is negative right now. They have like they're gone in the red. Like there is no mercy going on there. Everything is about judgment. They took all their funds and they're banking on if they're if they're a good Christian. What a good Christian looks like is telling everybody else how to live. They think that's a good Christian. If, if, if I take all the funds out and I put them into the judgment accounts, what I'm saying is if I don't walk the line perfectly, I'm saying to God and to you that it's okay to fry me. That's what you're saying because ultimately judge will, a judgment will be merciless. So the religious system that dwells in the church is constantly trying to get us to think mer judgment is good. Judgment is good in its arena. It's good in its place, but it has a limited function. And first person you're to judge is yourself. If you're quick to judge everyone and quick to let yourself go, you got it very backwards. Quick to let everybody else be okay. I mean, everybody else be told. And you like, well, you know, I'm just going through some stuff. 
Well, you know, I've been through some stuff. You, well, you know, I've, it's, it's just been hard. Everybody else you don't say that about you is like, take them out. Wow. Just take them out. <laughs> Forget about it. You tell the Shmita, oh, mighty Shmita, I've got a couple people. You've probably been looking at them already. So in this, in this reaping and sowing, uh, it says in Genesis chapter 8, it says when Noah built the ark, or he built the altar. This is after the Lord had him build the ark. He brought his family from utter destruction, and he brought his family out. And they get into this place where they're released into the back, uh, into, onto the land, and everything's been destroyed except for what's in the ark. Okay, this is Genesis 8.20. Listen carefully. Then Noah built an altar. We talked about altars last week. An altar is a place of remembrance. He built a place, an altar to the Lord, and he took of every clean animal and every clean bird, and he burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelt the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on the account of man. Do you guys know how many times before today I said man lives under the curse of Adam? Says it right there, he does not. I will never again curse the ground on account of man. I learned something just this week. It's a big deal. Why is it a big deal? Because the curse over Adam was that I'd have to live every day by the sweat of my brow. The earth was cursed and when I put seed in it, the thorns and thistles would destroy my seed. Guess what? It's not true anymore. I will never again curse the ground on account of man. Come on. That's good news. For the intent of man's heart is evil even from his youth. I will never again destroy every living thing as I've done, says the Lord. While earth remains, I'm going to set into motion a new law. Seed time and harvest time. Cold and and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So this is the law of reciprocity or sowing and reaping. If you think about where you want to be tomorrow and you sow no seed for tomorrow, you will not ever find tomorrow except for in your imagination. If you keep thinking about where you want to be tomorrow... And you never sow seed for tomorrow. You will never find yourself in tomorrow except in your imagination. I could keep saying this all day. I, 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 I almost got this, this Holy Spirit unction memorized. Because I was just like, what? No matter what we're believing God for, if we don't begin to sow into his plans, which literally means I do what I see my father doing, I see him doing it. No, I can't do everything he's showing me, but I can start. I can start some planting. I can start some watering. I don't see a forest, but I see some seeds. I see what I can do instead of seeing what I can't. How about I do my part so God can do his part? How about I do the possible so God can do the impossible? How about I start where I am instead of trying to daydream about tomorrow? I wish God would kill the daydreamer in me. I'm a, I am a serious daydreamer, but at the end of the day, I need to be a sower. I need to be a man that knows how to sow so that I can get into my tomorrow. I can enter tomorrow's dream because I sowed today what tomorrow's going to yield. And so if we want a different tomorrow, we have to begin sowing what tomorrow is going to look like. If I want a better marriage, I need to sow what an amazing marriage I want Versus sowing what I've been sowing. Because where I'm at is not her fault. Husbands that want to lead everything. Come on, husbands. <laughs> want to be the boss. I'm the boss. I'm the boss. Yeah, I sang my boss song for like a minute. The boss song wasn't too cool in my house. I'm like, I'm the boss. I'm the boss. Eh, yeah, what? Third day. I had to throw the pants on the bed. I was like, you want to wear them? This is a true story, by the way. You want to wear the pants? 
Now take it for granted, I'm talking about a single mom who's been sowing some seed. She got her own house. She got her own car. I'm living in my sister's basement. I just barely got out of college and just barely got a job. And she like, you don't even know which way's up yet, son. And I'm trying to ro rule the roost. I don't even know which way's north. So my boss man routine wasn't working too good. Even though the Bible said, and I could quote, and then we like sword fight for a while. And I get a couple severe wounds, a couple arteries opened up. You know, just fun. Fun in the family. Marriage fun. Sparring match without the gear. <laughs> and so I'm saying this to lighten up on the reality of what we face in our marriages, what we face in our families with our children, what we face on the job. It needs to be lightened up because the reality is I'm where I'm at because of what I sowed. And when I sow new things, I'll get new things. If my, if my atmosphere won't yield, I change my atmosphere. If that, if that has to do with the marriage, it's probably not as true as you would like to see. It's easy to pull the bailout cord. It's easy to pull the lever. And Jesus said, I gave you, I gave Moses the right to write um, divorce decrees because of hardness of heart. In other words, you wouldn't yield to what God wanted to do in the midst of the frustration and turbulence and trauma and stuff. I, now, that doesn't make certain things okay. And I think all of us should learn to put boundaries and still act like Christ in the midst of our boundaries. Look, you're not going to touch me. It, my wife had been through so much abuse by the time we got married. If I raised my voice too loud, it meant 911. <laughs> I know it's right. She's like, you ain't yelling at me in my house. Carol's like, I ain't ever getting. That sounds extreme, but you know what it told me? That sounds extreme, and I, at first I thought, you are something else. But I didn't ever once, because of a religious spirit, didn't ever once think about my own behavior. Isn't that terrible? I'm thinking about, what is she thinking? Now my neighbors, now this, now that. I care about everything except for my own behavior. I'll tell you what it did. It showed me my behavior. It took some time. I never got in trouble. Thank God. Thank God. You ain't yelling at Tracy. If you're me, at least. Everybody else gets to, but not me. I'm not allowed to. <laughs> so I learned. That was uh, the first two or three years. We got that straight. That was boundary number one. You're not going to act like every jack leg that lived in my life before. I'm going to set you straight. I'm a... I'm a Christian woman, and you ain't going to treat me like anything. You're going to treat me like a child of God, and if that's not okay, I'm going to be protected. Hear it, because it's really important. Because here's the thing. Until I set a boundary that says it's not okay for you to do whatever you want to do in my life, and I stay with a smile, I stay with love, I stay with sincerity. Notice I said that too. That's pretty important. Because the emotions are running, what do you want them to remember? You were so upset that you called 911? Or do you want them to remember you did something extreme because you wanted to show that it's not okay? All right? It's really important. So, talking about seed time and harvest time, I want to begin to sow into my tomorrow. Listen, guys, if you want a bright tomorrow, learn to begin to plant the things that you're looking for. How do you do that? Because I, I, I come to realize that half the things I think are obvious are just completely not obvious. So I'm going to try to become Captain Obvious these next couple years. It's my goal to be Captain Obvious. If I state the obvious, then at least I know you heard. Here's the thing. Here's how I get mercy. I sow mercy. What does a seed of mercy look like? It means that 
when somebody does something wrong that they don't get what they deserve for me. Y'all said amen way too quick. You don't even know what I'm talking about. For real, you don't, you don't have a clue. You know why I know? Because you heard my words, but your actions are completely the opposite. Everybody that does you wrong, you make sure that you let them know that you're wrong. This is all. You better pay me back. You better buy me a new one. You better do it. You better make it right. You better, you, you owe me. In fact, I own you. You're mine. No straw in your bricks. You're going down. The whole nine yards. And, and I'm saying this because this is how I realized that, you, that people didn't get it. Because people are quick to judge the actions of others towards them, not judge their own actions. And I'm talking about sowing mercy. You don't get what you deserve. Guess what? Somebody does something that's very wrong to you is the best opportunity to give yourself an upgrade. The upgrade is, oh my gosh, look, somebody did me wrong. Why did Jesus make it such a big deal that when people did evil to love your enemies, why was he saying it? He wasn't saying it so you could be a, a doormat. He was saying because you have the best opportunity for an upgrade. Somebody's being evil to you. Look at this. Rejoice. I'm talking about an upgrade because if I can sow mercy when you don't deserve it, I'm going to put stuff into my bank that is hard to come by. It's going to be hard to get this stuff. It's going to be hard to get this mercy stuff. And the only way I can get mercy is to not do what people deserve. It's hard to get mercy in your account. That's why I should have made it more of a tank that's barely like anything left. And that's why some people feel like every time I do something wrong, everybody gets away with stuff except for me. <laughs> everybody gets away with stuff except for me. Like every time I just like I just get near the line and they look at me and they, Ugh. you know why? Because there's nothing in your bank, mercy bank. It's completely empty. You're quick about everybody else being wrong, but your mercy is shot. Negative. So, this is really good truth, but actually it's not the point of the message. The point of the message is a much higher truth. And so, when we talk about grace, or empowering grace, we're talking about something that encompasses these two truths. And I, we're talking about how powerful these truths are. We're talking about how po powerful these truths are. God was saying to me, those truths, even though especially mercy sounds so amazing... It's so small. It would be like drawing a dot and then this huge circle that I couldn't represent to you. It'd be like an eraser sized dot and then the size of this room. Because the proportions of what grace can do if it's activated, if grace is activated, what it would do for you, what it would do in you, through you, around you, to everybody around you. It would make Nazarite anointing look small. Where you can take a whole city by yourself. I'm going for it. I'm taking the city. I'm going to take a city. I'm going to take this region. Yeah, you could do it. All you have to do is learn to activate grace. So that as we uh, look at this next slide here, we talk about grace and, and encompassing uh, mercy and judgment. Because here's why. Grace literally means to, um, it means to get what we don't deserve. Grace means to get what we don't deserve. So we, we'll start again. Mercy means. I promise I'm not tricking you. I'm just asking you to repeat what I said five times. Let it off the hook. Okay. Don't get what you deserve. Mercy. Don't get what you deserve. Judgment. Everybody knows what that means, right? Judgment means you get what you deserve. It's coming to you. I'm going to make sure. I'll make sure it's coming to you. It's coming to you. I'm enforcer. I'm, a, I'm the enforcer around here. I'm going to make sure. God, you saw what they did. Yeah, judgment, you know. It's crazy stuff. I'm, I'm making light of it, but it's sickening how it's in the church. It's got to go. 
this is the evic- this is the eviction notice. I refuse to have a house where there's ju- where there's judgmental spirits. It is not going to be okay. We will come against it so hard and so furious that either you let it go or you go. Either you let it go or you go. We don't have place for it because it only plagues the body. Everybody knows how to be judges. No one knows how to be merciful. So um, as you guys were looking at that, the last one is grace. We get what we don't deserve. Okay, we'll try this one again. Grace is I don't get, I mean, I get what I don't deserve. I get what I don't deserve. I get what I don't deserve. Now that sounds ridiculous. That's what the, the apostles were going around telling. This is what God has done. This is called grace. We're going to give a name to it. It's going to be called grace. This is what God has done. This is going to, we're going to give a name to it. This thing that God has done, we're going to call it the gospel, but we're going to give it one word. It's going to be called grace. This is what the Lord has done. He gave me what I don't deserve, what I couldn't pay for, what I couldn't live for. He gave me what I couldn't earn. He gave me what a lifetime couldn't have got me. And that is grace. This grace, guys, is the law of inheritance. The law of inheritance. Now, reaping and sowing will endure forever. As long as the earth remains so far, feels pretty solid. Still spinning. Everything's on par. Yeah? Yeah? Everything's still spinning. Everything's still solid. Seed time, harvest time, still there. Here's the thing. If I want grace, I have to learn to sow grace Because reaping and sowing will give me into an account that is much more valuable. Did you ever hear in Revelations where it talks about gold refined by the fire? That you would go to the refiner and you would trade everything so you could get this upgrade? This upgrade is called grace. It's one of the top ones. Love is also. But listen to this. Grace is giving people what they don't deserve. You know the main reason we get judged, Tracy and I is giving people what they don't deserve. Like, what are you doing helping those people? They need to help themselves. I get it. They do. After we teach them how. So our goal is to enlarge our grace account by being people that are sowing for our tomorrow. What we're sowing for tomorrow, Tracy, Elders, pastors, what you're sowing for tomorrow, people that are supporting and partnering with the ministry, what you're sowing for tomorrow is a harvest that has the purest gold and the purest, the purest of God's heart in it is to give people what they do not deserve. If we can give them what they don't deserve, then they'll know we're Christians because we love one another And we love each other when it's not supposed to work that way. It's not, see, people want to see you give somebody what they don't deserve because that's the thing that makes their mind go crazy. Being loving to somebody who's treating you evil is giving them what they don't deserve. And when you do it, it says it will be like setting hot coals on their head. Hot coals on their head. And when you set these coals on their head, they will literally be like, sometimes they'll act even crazier. But at the end of the day, they're going to remember something. Grace happened here. Love happened here. And when you gave me what I didn't deserve, I'm left contemplating who am I and who are you. That's what we need to leave people with. Not I'm like you and... You go off, me too. But when you act a fool, I want to be acting like Jesus. And give you what you don't deserve and not reciprocate how you're acting. Because when I do that, I look like my father. And when I look like my father, the things that my father wanted to do in the earth are released in the earth. Amen? All right, I think I got a minute. I got a minute. I'm going to come on up. 
Got your mic? All right, so I was talking about this prodigal son uh, in the afternoon service, and I know a lot of people in here don't go to the afternoon service. And uh, I challenge you to read every time you read the Bible, to always read it with the most enthusiastic first time ever view. If you, if you lose your respect for what God and cost martyrs their blood, he really lost a lot more than familiarity. We can't become familiar with the things of God. The things of God are not common. They're precious. And so this scripture is one of the most common that everybody says, like, I've, I've, I heard that one. I've heard it, like, a lot. And guess what? I've learned even more this time than I learned the other four times I had to learn it. And I'm like, how many times can you show me something new from the same thing? Like, every time you do, you, the Lord reveals it to you, you feel like you were dense to miss it. <laughs> You're like... That was so obvious. God's like, yeah, to me. <laughs> so prodigal son's amazing. And I actually, Z, Z came like two days after I, I, I first realized this, this understanding about the prodigal son. The prodigal son, um, when I was, I, was, uh, at, I was complaining to the Lord about how people are uh, really struggling these days. Most of you guys are getting ready to say amen because it's Christmas and you're going to feel this spirit heavily. The spirit of entitlement. And I started talking about the spirit of entitlement and I was like, I don't like the way people think that, you know, you should just give and give. And they, they don't even respect the fact that you're giving it. Now they think that you owe it to them. You come into your house and they're like, you owe me. Hey, what's in the fridge? Oh, is that my food? I'll take some of your food. And they don't even ask. They, don't, they come to your house. Could you imagine that? Wouldn't that be weird to you? Or like people coming to your house and just like scoop food off, off of your frying pan. And they think it's their food in your frying pan. Wouldn't that be weird? I think it's weird. So I was like, ah, God, rah, rah, rah. And I usually am uh, kind of, they get what they don't deserve. Okay, so I'm usually gracious. Yeah, oh, yeah, you like that food there. Okay, enjoy that food. So I'm usually gracious, but inside I was going, God, what's up with this? What's this thing going on in the earth? And it seems like the younger the people are, the worse it's getting. And I'm like, I don't like that. And I'm complaining to the Lord. And the Lord says, I think it's awesome. And I was like, what? He says, yeah, that's why I told that prodigal son story. And I was like, what? Same what, yeah. I could go higher with it, Jeremy. <laughs> So, I'm like, you're freaking me out. What do you mean that this entitlement thing you like? He says, because the one son that had entitlement came to me and saw that I was such a good father, I would give him half my inheritance without even dying. He's like, that's pretty amazing to me. And I'm like, what? <laughs> the exact same what, yes, all three times. So, I'm freaking out because I'm like, this is like the loser kid that gets a bunch of money and don't know what to do with it except for try to be cool. Like he's buying friends in all the wrong places. He's doing all the wrong things with everything God gives him. What's the religious kid doing? Working for something he's never going to see. Because he never has any faith to ask his father for the goodness that he's with him. He says, you're with, with me always, son. You're with me always. And you never ask me for anything. Like, I would have given you much more than a fat, the fatted calf. I mean, I would have gave you anything you wanted because I'm with you always. In other words, we're so together, all you had to do is ask. I would have given it to you. But your brother, he asks for something. And when I give it to him, and then he almost kills himself on what he's given now you want to judge your brother instead of seeing 
your brother's strength instead of seeing how God. So here's how entitlement works, guys. If we can get down this understanding the same way that uh, sin is running really heavily in the in the area of of the, the spirit of pharmacia or a drug addiction is like especially in pharmaceuticals is like the gateway like, oh, it makes sense. My, you know, I think I think my toe hurts. Uh, yeah. Can I just uh, like it's real bad, like probably need something serious for it. Like I think the more I think about it, the more it hurts. In fact, the doctor's like, OK. Yeah, we'll just give you a morphine drip right now for your toe. You know, it's like, thanks, doc. <laughs> so it's like free pharmacia for everybody. You know, spirit of spirit of pharmacia is going out for everybody. All these drugs and then then the accessibility of pornography and through through every device you have, and all those things are running things, and they could be looked at in, in the hideous way that they are, but they could also be looked at what God's doing in the people. He's showing people the void that they have, and he's showing people the hunger that they can have. You haven't seen real hunger till you've seen a heroin addict that, that hasn't used for a whole day, and he's been using for uh, five years. I, know, I had a friend that, that shot uh, heroin. He shot 10 pills a day. So that's $100 a day. He, he had a job making like $35, $40 an hour as a welder. And... Uh, so, not, not to mention, obviously, he died a few times and was resuscitated and all those things. Uh, one time he woke up in the hospital with a toe tag. The guy was filling out his paperwork when he came to. I don't know what it's going to take, but if, if we can wake up to how we've been sedated how we've been taken away and how we've been misled and awakened to the passionate one that lives on the inside of me. And I can redirect all that same passion, the passion that would cause me day and night to think about nothing else but that thing that I'm so uh, hooked on, that thing that's so overtaken me or, or, or the, the, how everybody owes me. And I can redirect that to the goodness of God and I can start going, man, I could have everything that the Lord wants for me. I can have anything that this life has for me because I can begin to see I am that passionate on the inside. Everybody else might s sit here in America and just like work their nine to five and, and think it's okay. People are coming flooding into this country because they believe this is the land of opportunity, the land of dreams, because they see something in this place in America. And, and Brooke was telling us that if you made $7.50 an hour, you would make the top 13% of the world's economy. You would be 13% top richest people if you had a job working 30 hours, not even full time. 30 hours, 750 an hour. You would make 13% top echelon right there, bro. Minimum wage. That's me. Isn't that crazy? So, so I took a little bit of time because I want you to see no matter what you've been through and no matter where you've been, the kind of person that you have the capacity to be, potential to be, that potential energy needs to be unlocked. It's unlocked by the Lord and it's caused by having a new outlet. You can't get rid of the old stuff and don't put something new in. The passion on the inside of you is going to call it to be filled. So... If we take that same passion and we take the, now the goodness of the Lord and say, uh, Lord, I thank you that you're so good. I thank you that you're so good. You're going to give me inheritance before you even die. That's crazy. Half of the inheritance goes straight to this person because he believes that his father is so good. That's ridiculous. And the reason why, the reason why we need to learn this is because although... The father's good. If I start, if I continue to operate in the spirit where everybody owes me, I'm also going to lose everything I have. Because I've sown in the wind and I'm going to reap in the wind. I didn't sow gratitude and say, God, I, Father, I thank you that you're so generous. H how can I make this work for me? How can I take what you've given me like You've given me so much. Wouldn't it be awesome if you actually today could say, God, you've given me so much. And stop the 
the Lodabar thinking, this mully grub. My life is a, pathetic. I'm a worm. Like God's giving you so much. Go back to him in gratitude and say, how can I make this work so I don't squander it all? Because here's what it is. Jesus was comparing the principle of that half of the inheritance that was given to that one son to the life that was given to you. He was saying, I gave you so much. I gave you half the inheritance. I gave you half. I, I, I sent my son and died so you could have this inheritance. And then you're like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to do, do my own thing. That's cool. Thanks. And you just go on your own way and squander it. And here's the thing. Today, God's heart's crying out to you. Would you start to sow into the future that you see, that you want? Instead of thinking about it, start believing, start speaking it, and start saying what God's saying over your life. Come, can you stand to your feet, Tracy? So before I say what I wanted to say, um, if I could see Carol and Terry after service, please. Also, um, for all visitors today, Pastor George, can you wave your hand? Is Pastor George in here? Okay, Pastor George is right here. He would like to meet with all visitors in that the door right there behind him, just for a couple minutes, please. The green room. Okay. But what what was on my heart was, um, and it has to do with the mercy. So first, we have to remember that we don't. A lot of times, I think we we forget that we're not really out to get each other, and we're not really out to hurt each other. You know, so sometimes it's hard because. <laughs> okay. Sometimes it's hard because our, our first our first instinct as humans is our past abuse. One way or another, we've all been abused. And we all hold on to stuff. That's why we need God more and more every day in our life. So if we can just remember that we're not out to get each other and that we do mean well for each other, even in wrongdoing to one to another. The Bible says to seek love and to seek understanding, and in all things get understanding. So the one thing I always do is I always ask the Lord to help me in understanding. Like, people have talked about me in the church, outside of the church. It doesn't matter. It happens. But get understanding and trust that their heart is really not trying to be evil against you. Go to your sister. Go to your brother and try to have a conversation with them about it. If it doesn't work out, then you come and you get a leader and you go together. But try your best to always walk in mercy. And the thing that uh, Pastor David was saying about, um, see, God's, so if you feel like somebody's expecting something, do the opposite. God's ways are the opposite. And you will reap back the opposite for your own life, for the better. The main reason that's so important is that we're all called to care for each other's souls. We're all called to make sure we don't cause one to stumble. And if we can really love each other right, do you know how much love you're going to reap back? Not just from God alone, but from people. The main thing is when you have a heart for your sister and brother to get closer to God, you won't do things that's going to hurt that walk. You just won't. No matter what's been done to you. Jesus says, forgive them, for I, they know not what they do. A lot of times, if you have trouble with forgiveness, I want you to practice saying that. If you're a person that has trouble with forgiveness, when things happen, I want you to practice saying, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And sometimes they don't, just like sometimes we haven't. Mercy is a very touchy thing to my heart. And I want everyone to have it. We're entitled to that gift. The only reason we don't walk in it is because we don't choose to. That is the only reason. I had something real quick. Um, And it's so cool because Pastor Tracy's heart right there was for the mercy. And when I was sitting there, I was just, you know, meditating on what Pastor David said. And that word was just so awesome. And as I was sitting there and he was talking about mercy, 
and he was talking about us getting rid of this judgment spirit, I saw in my spirit that there were people that took that a little too far and said, okay, I'm going to, that gives me the excuse to do whatever it is that I want to do and get away with it because he's going to grace it away or he's going to mercy it away. And again, like Pastor David said, there is that balance. The reason why that we are so having the understanding on mercy now is because there is a place of maturity in God where, like Pastor David said, we will be able to judge, but you cannot judge without mercy. Judgment is a place of maturity in God. That's why he is the judge, because he's merciful and he is love. So we will never be in the place to judge responsibly and according to the word of God until we know how to handle what they just said, which is be merciful. But just because we have mercy and just because we have grace, Galatians says, Paul said, he said, shall I continue in sin so that grace will abound? Absolutely not, he says. The choice to continue in that sin is going to reap judgment because sin's already been judged. It always brings death no matter what. Resolve that in our hearts. But in addition to that, again, don't take what we're saying. Don't take what, you know, like I said, what Pastor David is saying and use that as an excuse to continue in sin. Use it as an excuse to change and to live a life of an example of what love looks like so that you can become mature in Christ and be able to judge. Amen. I'm going to I'm going to say this. I'm going to read this scripture over you guys. Um, I'll be preaching more on this scripture in the afternoon. Um, it says in Ephesians 1, chapter 15, uh, verse 15, chapter 1, verse 15, why, I'm going to read this over you, and as I read it over you, I want you to receive the empowering grace of the Lord, which is your inheritance. <clears throat> why, I also, after I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the love to all the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened, that you may know the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of of his power towards usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power in us, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and he set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that one that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness that fills all in all. So, yes, so that's what we have to look forward to, this kind of inheritance. Um, we're going to enjoy some fellowship together. Uh, we need to meet together also with our India team, so as we're doing our food, I want to make sure that we're meeting with our India team. We missed. Uh, we, we have to make sure that we have a good, clear, communicated schedule, and we're going to uh, appoint somebody to kind of do the do the communications there. And uh, we're going to get. Our, we're going to be going to India soon. If you guys haven't heard, I'm really excited about that. And I think you guys are going to Cambodia. Is it July, January? All right. So we're really excited for the missions for next year. We're setting up already. Amen. So. Let's also make sure we're blessing and just having an a awesome time with uh, everybody that's able to come out today and, uh, and bless the children that have come. Thank you, uh, Darnice. Thank you for the angel tree idea and just allowing us to be able to pour out to the children in the church and, and the children in our communities. So God bless you so much. Thank you. We appreciate you coming out. And if anybody does 